Uh, our next thing is on gases. As a general rule of thumb, I think, if you ask the students, the first unit that we did is probably the second hardest of the units. Um, this unit that we're about to do, I would say almost every person thinks gases is the easiest unit. So hopefully you'll find that this is a little bit easier. Um, it, there's nowhere near as much material. There's actually only six topics rather than ten, so it's actually way more condensed. Um, in terms of gases, um, I would say that every question you get is going to fall into one of two categories. Either it's going to be like a calculation type question, where you have to find a molar mass, use grams, use liters, and do some sort of um, like math type equation. Or it's a theory question. And to be honest, even as you look back through like the first unit on solutions, you can probably narrow it down and say either you had to do a calculation and find a number, or you had to interpret and use your understanding to answer some sort of theory. Does that make sense? You can start kind of narrowing things down into theory or math. So this unit, you'll notice that especially. OK, let me start talking here. Um, we're going to talk about gases today. Basically, it's just some properties of gases. That's all we really want to want to mention. You guys probably intuitively know everything I'm going to say today, because you know stuff about gas. Like For example, there is gas all around us right now. Um, we don't see gas, but we know it's there still. For example, because we live in southern Alberta, we have wind quite a bit. How does wind prove that gases exist? Anybody want to stab at that? What is wind? Fast moving air, yeah. Wind is when gases are moving. Now, if I were to like hit some gas particles towards Tristan, is he really going to notice it? <sighs> Probably not, <laughs> right? But if there was enough particles moving, like say a large system of Air Ms. Badney, can you please call 100? Ms. Badney, please call 100. We notice that when it's windy out, right? What's really happening when you feel wind is you're feeling particles hitting you. Does that make sense? If I threw my water bottle at one of you guys, that would really hurt because there are a lot of particles all in a small, dense state. Does that make sense? But really, that's what wind is. Wind is really all of the air, so that's like nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide. All of those particles are hitting you, and you notice it. Does that make sense? So maybe you've never really thought of it in that sort of way, but you probably know something about gases. So here's some properties. Um, I would suggest write those down on your formula data booklet somewhere, just so that you don't have memorized. Uh, gases always fill their containers. Probably the best example of gases filling their containers is a balloon. When you guys blow air from your lungs into a balloon, it expands the, or the balloon and it, it fills it up. Does that make sense? The gas doesn't just sit in like one corner of the balloon being like a deflated balloon. It always, it like, you know what I mean? It blows the balloon up, right? Uh, second property of gases, they're highly compressible. Now it's probably a good time to talk about this. I'm just going to draw a couple of pictures here. This is what a solid might look like at a molecular level. As a solid, there's a whole bunch of particles, and they are tightly, tightly stuck together. And so again, if I threw my water bottle at somebody, that would hurt, because there's a whole bunch of particles stuck together in a small space. Does that make sense? Liquids might look more like this. There's a particle here and there and there, but there's a little bit of like wiggle room in between. So for example, I can swim through water because liquids, there's actually like more space in between the particles and I can maneuver them. If I were to throw my water at Tristan, it probably wouldn't hurt him as much. Does that make sense? Because really the water will have the ability to slosh around and pass it. Well, gases, gases are very spread out. Gases are like super far apart from each other. And so what that means is you can collect all those gas particles and squish them all together. Maybe you guys have heard of the term like compressed gases. 
You ever heard that before? Um, I know like when I used to play hockey, they used to have like these little CO2 cartridges that you'd attach to a thing to like pump up your hockey skates. You guys ever used those before? You know what I'm talking about? Or um, like say propane. When you go to um, go to fill up your barbecue tank, like they, they shove a whole bunch of propane all into a cylinder. Right. Gases can be squished in. Does that make sense? So that's compressible. Does anybody know what diffuse means? Yes, spread out. Okay. So for example, let's say you had a balloon and you popped the balloon. Does the, all of the gas just stay in the balloon? Well, no, the balloon goes and flies everywhere, right? Because the gas will escape the balloon and try to spread out everywhere. Maybe the best example of this is if, if uh, uh, who was it that brought ribs in here yesterday? You brought ribs in yesterday, right? Right? And slowly but surely, everybody in the room can smell those ribs. And you're like, oh, why did you bring ribs in the classroom? What's happened is all of the particles that contain the gas, the gas particles that contain the smell of ribs, have slowly but surely migrated throughout the room until everyone can finally smell that sweet barbecue sauce. Does that make sense? Okay. So anyways, three properties of gases I need you guys to know. Write them down somewhere. In terms of Earth, Earth has what's called an atmosphere. And again, you guys probably have heard of this before. Earth is able to support life because in our atmosphere, there are useful gases for us. The two most useful ones are carbon dioxide and oxygen. We need the oxygen for breathing. And if you guys don't know this, when you breathe back out again, you're breathing out carbon dioxide. You guys aware of this? Okay. Actually, that's not what most of our atmosphere is made of, though. Do you guys know what the 70-something percent of our atmosphere is actually made of? Good. Nitrogen gas is actually the remaining part of our atmosphere. Okay. Um, why does our atmosphere exist? Why do all of these gases stay close to Earth? And why don't all of the gases like oxygen and nitrogen, why don't they just go floating out into space? Yes, that's the answer. Gravity. Because Earth has gravity, just like this board doesn't go floating away, gases are also particles with mass. Although they have the ability to move around, sure, due to gravity, they can't. all of our gas can't just leave us. Does that make sense? Because if it did, then there'd be no oxygen left on Earth and we'd all suffocate. Does that make sense? It's also a reason why, if you guys have ever heard of, like, say, um, like when you go on the top of Mount Everest, the further up you go in terms of altitude, the less effect gravity has, the further away from Earth you get. Does that make sense? And so that's why at higher altitudes, there's actually less atmosphere there, and it's harder to breathe. So if you try to climb Mount Everest, you actually have to bring oxygen tanks with you, because you probably won't make it otherwise. You ever heard of that before? Um, I'm a sports fan. There's, a, there's actually a huge issue with athletes who play in Denver. You guys ever heard of this before? Playing in Denver, Colorado? Denver is basically on the top of the Rocky Mountains. And due to that, the composition in the atmosphere there is much less to the point where a lot of athletes will actually like get quite tired when they try to play sports in Denver because there's just not enough oxygen for their bodies to be able to, to play at peak conditions. So a lot of teams will actually bring their own oxygen tanks. And you might see an athlete like breathing oxygen on the sidelines. Uh, there was once a guy who played for the Pittsburgh Steelers, a football player, and uh, he had a, a unique blood condition where his blood did not receive oxygen quite as well as everyone else. And he wasn't allowed to play whenever they went to Denver to go play. Like, his team wouldn't let him play because it was actually possible that he might die on the field just due to not getting enough oxygen. So, anyways, I digress. I'm getting off topic. Um, moving on here. Have you guys ever heard of the term pressure? Uh, pressure is defined by something called a Pascal, which is confusing enough on its own because a Pascal is a force over a meter squared. I'm going to write this out here. A Pascal, PA, is a Newton over a meter squared. How much, you guys probably haven't done a ton of physics before, I'm guessing. Do you guys know like the definition of force? Heard, heard like a force is defined as a. Oh. Say louder. Yeah, push or pull. Have you guys heard that before? Okay. Gas particles are all around us right now, and you don't notice them because they're very small. But they are hitting you. Does that make sense? 
As I'm sitting here right now, there's gas moving throughout the room, and it's running into me and hitting me. It's hitting the walls, it's hitting Sophie, it's hitting Tristan. Does that make sense? I just breathed out. Those gas particles are going to eventually move everywhere. Does that make sense? Well, pressure then is defined as how much force those particles have over a square meter. So imagine a meter stick. I don't, I'm not going to get up and get one, but a meter stick's about yay long. So make a square out of a meter stick. Okay. However much those gas particles happen to hit a square meter width, if that's one newton worth of force, that's known as a pascal. If you guys ever watch like the weather report, they'll talk about how there's like barometric pressure. That really refers to them like how are the gas particles around us, how hard are they hitting things as they move. Does that make sense? Um, one of the things that depends on atmospheric pressure then is your height above sea level. The higher you get above sea level, what should happen to the pressure? Well, what happens to the amount of particles the higher you get above sea level? There's less of them. Does that make sense? The higher up you go in terms of altitude, the less particles there are because there's less gravity there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If there's less particles, how are they going to ping around and hit you if there's less of them? Does that make sense? So one of the things that you might see in, like, say, a diagram here is that way down here at sea level, there might be a... Uh, this is a different unit of pressure, by the way, but there might be 1,000 pressure units. But then as you go up in altitude, now there's only 900 for pressure. And as you keep going up, there's only 800 for pressure. Does that make sense? At a certain point, if you get high enough, there really won't be any pressure left. There won't be any particles. And you guys probably know, like, when you go into outer space, you need to wear your special spacesuit and helmet because there's no air up there for you to breathe. That makes sense. There is like very little to almost no pressure in uh, even actually airplanes. It's so high up in terms of altitude that they have to pressurize the cabins. You guys ever heard that term before? Like there's air pressure inside airplanes because there, there's so little oxygen up there. Does that make sense? Or if not oxygen, there's so little gas. So here's a number I need you to know then. At sea level, pressure is generally about 101 KPAs. Do you know what KPA stands for? Good, it's a kilopascal. Basically, it's a thousand pascals. And just so you remember, a pascal is how much force pushing, typically, there would be on a square meter. So it would be like a thousand of those over a square meter. Um, here's some more numbers I need you guys to write down. Uh, probably in your data booklets, the best spot. Okay. Scientists used the value of 101 KPAs as a benchmark, and they, def they decided to, rather than work with the number 101 all the time, they decided to call that one atmosphere. So technically, one atmosphere is known as 101.325 KPAs. This number here, because there's more decimal places, is now more precise. So, uh, you guys know how like uh, we don't measure donuts in individuals; we measure them in dozens. And same thing with like moles for molecules. It's kind of the same thing here. Rather than always talking about 101-ish kilopascals, they decided just to say that that's now equivalent to one atmosphere. So that's another unit of pressure. Atmospheres is a unit of pressure. They decided to call that then the standard temperature and pressure. So a standard pressure would be 101.325 atmos. Sorry, standard pressure would be 101.325 kilopascals, which is actually one atmosphere, and it's zero degrees Celsius. That was known as like what was standard for the longest time, and then scientists had a realization that, that was a really stupid idea. Anyone have any idea why that was a dumb idea to make that the standard unit? Zero degrees Zero degrees Celsius means that it's really cold out. And so like, let's say you were a scientist and you wanted to do a lab under what were called standard conditions. You would then have to turn the thermostat in your, in your lab down to zero degrees Celsius every time you did an experiment. Who wants to work at zero Celsius all the time? Does that make sense? It was kind of a boneheaded mistake to call the standard unit zero Celsius 
So later, they kind of redid it, and they made it standard ambient temperature and pressure. And they made it 25 degrees Celsius instead. That makes sense. So that, that way, if you were working under standard ambient conditions, you could at least work with it under like a normal temperature range. They also made one more tweak. They figured, well, rather than making it 101.325 kilopascals, which is like a, a really weird number to use, they said, Let, let's just go with 100, because it's round. So write this down somewhere. If you were a scientist working in a lab, and I said work under standard conditions, you would have to set the thermometer to zero degrees Celsius. And you'd have to work with 101.325 kilopascals, which is roughly what sea level is. We're never going to work under STP conditions. If I told you as a scientist to work under SATP conditions, set your thermometer to about 25, which is room temperature-ish, and try to find 100 kilopascals of pressure. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, bit of a history lesson. Pressure is actually something that we can measure. We have a tool to measure pressure. Does anybody know the name of the tool? It's on the slide, actually. Tool we use to measure pressure. It's called a barometer. It's the last word on there. A, a, a barometer, kind of like a thermometer, only barometer. A barometer is a tool that you measure pressure with. So I'd like to try to describe to you how some of the prehistoric, like original barometers worked. Uh, the first guy who built one was named uh, Torricelli, and he used a substance that we would never use anymore, but he used mercury. Uh, we actually use mercury in thermometers up until recently, but they've since changed it because mercury is pretty toxic. That's a bad thing to use. Um, one of the things that makes mercury unique, though, is that it's a liquid. Even though it's a non, even though it's a metal, it's actually liquid, which means that liquids we can kind of push them around a little bit. That makes sense. I can't put my hand through my water bottle. This is a solid, but I can kind of put my hand through water because it's a liquid. And so, kind of similar concept here. Mercury has a little bit of pliability to it. That makes sense. Hope this diagram makes sense. What he did is he used a long, thin tube. Like in your mind, maybe just imagine a thermometer. It wasn't a thermometer, but imagine a thermometer. And Due to the fact that there's atmospheric pressure, there are molecules of gas all around us. Those molecules are moving. And they're going to be hitting the mercury down here. I mean, it's going to hit that. It's going to hit this. It's going to hit this. But some of those particles are going to be hitting the mercury right here. Does that make sense? It's not a lot, but it's a little bit of pressure. I mean, it's nowhere near as much pressure as if I, like, I push. Does that make sense, though? And because of the fact that those molecules are getting pushed, it actually causes the mercury in the little tube to rise up. And so Torricelli took his little thermometer, barometer is the term we use, took it down to sea level, because I think he lived in Italy, so we could just go down to the Adriatic coast or something, and uh, discovered that at sea level, his thermometer was 760 millimeters. That's how like tall the, um, the mercury was. Does that make sense? And so that was his first way of trying to measure how much pressure there was. Let's say there was more pressure on a given day. What would you expect would happen to the little barometer then? If it was, if it was like a high pressure day. It would go up, yeah. Because if the molecules are moving just a little bit faster with a little bit more force, you'd have a little bit more force and it would cause your barometer to go up. And then what happens if it was like a low pressure type day? It would go down. It's kind of like the first weather forecaster, because that's what weather forecasters do. Um, they try to figure out whether there's high pressure or low pressure systems coming in. You guys ever seen like the weatherman with the little H on the map or the L's on the map? That's kind of this concept here. Uh, is Are the gas particles, do they have more force and therefore more pressure? Or do they have less force and therefore less pressure? Again, do we really notice this as humans on a daily basis? I guess not really, right? But Air particles are hitting you the whole time that we've been talking here. The only reason you might notice it is because there's a, a fan, and a fan blows them towards you with more force, so you can feel it. So, Here's what that means, though. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead. This just talks about weather. Uh, usually when pressure increases, it means good weather. 
Okay. Here's what this means then. There are now three different ways to measure pressure. Ideally, there would only be one way, but as science evolved over time, all three of these things are, are considered to be equivalent to each other. 760 millimeters of mercury, this is how Torricelli defined pressure back in the 1600s. He did this at sea level. Well, at sea level, if we measure it using kilopascal units, it's that 101.325 number. Or another way of measuring pressure is to say that that's like one atmosphere. And really, these zeros kind of go on for forever. It's kind of, if you could go back in time and kind of say, okay, hey, let's not have three ways of measuring pressure. Let's have one way of measuring pressure. That would really be nice. But it's kind of like with temperature. You guys know how we measure temperature in Celsius and the Americans measure in Fahrenheit. And it's kind of too late to go back and be like, okay, everyone's doing this one. And so like for the rest of time, we're probably going to have two systems of measuring temperature. It's kind of the same thing for pressure. There's three ways of measuring it. So millimeters of mercury, or atmospheres, or kilopascals. So my only goal today, then, is to help you guys work with these units. I'm going to do three examples. So this might be, if you don't have notes in front of you, this might be what you want to write. So let's say you're on Mount Everest. On the top of Mount Everest, what should the air pressure be compared to like where we're at? Higher or lower? Lower. Why? It's higher up, and higher up there's less gravity, and therefore gravity affects the air particles less, so therefore there's more air lower and less air higher, so there should be less pressure at Mount Everest. Does that make sense? Okay. Normally, pressure is like in the 101 range. Clearly right here, Mount Everest is only 33, so you're going to want to bring an oxygen tank there. My question is, how many atmospheres is this? Well, I'm a big fan of trying to teach you ratios. So here's how I might write it. 33.7 kPas. I no longer want to have the unit kPas. So I'm going to put kPas on the bottom. See how that would make it cancel? Yeah. The unit that I want is atmospheres. We, we abbreviate atmospheres with ATMs. Last question then. What is the relationship between atmospheres and kilopascals? Yeah, and really, we can just write it as like one ATM. Don't bother writing all the zeros afterwards. It's, it's like exactly the number one. We've just chosen to define sea level as one. Uh, what about for kilopascals? There you go, yeah. So in order to solve this problem, take 33.7 times by one, which is kind of redundant, and divide by 101.325. That's how many atmospheres there's going to be. I don't have my calculator nearby, so someone will have to help me with this. Three 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 five. Two five. That'll probably do for now. Okay, let's talk significant digits. This number right here had three significant digits. This number down here has six significant digits. This one atmosphere has infinity significant digits. Like it is, it, we have chosen for it to be exactly the number one, like 1.0, and those zeros go for it forever. Does that make sense? So, uh, based on sig digs, then you get three, so this would be 0 0.333 atmospheres. And hopefully that kind of makes sense. Sea level has been defined as one atmosphere, which is about 101 kilopascals. Well, we're way on top of Mount Everest. There's way less pressure because there's way less gas because there's way less gravity. Which means there's way less molecules. That train of thought makes sense. Basically, there's a third as much, so therefore you have about a third of an atmosphere. Does that make sense? Yeah. Try another one. Uh, let's say that you go diving. Anybody ever gone diving before? Okay, so maybe you've heard of some concept called like the bends. 
Um, if you haven't heard of it before, basically what ends up happening when you go underwater, underwater it's actually the opposite. It's very pressurized. Like your body is being bombarded on all sides with a lot of water. And it actually kind of changes the composition of, the, of your blood and the gases in your blood, mainly the nitrogen-oxygen combination. And so you can actually get a disease called the bends if you don't actually rise from the bottom of your ocean floor at a slow enough rate. So that's not really relevant to this question. But the point here is that underwater, it's 4.2 atmospheres. You are being bombarded with so much water pressure on all sides of you that, I mean, that's why they need to make like submarines also pressurized to be able to deal with the fact that like water is going to cause them to collapse otherwise. Does that make sense? So my question is, can we convert 4.2 atmospheres? So this is highly pressurized. Can we convert this into millimeters of mercury? So here's what I'd recommend. We're looking for millimeters of mercury, which is a very ancient unit of pressure. We don't really use it very much anymore sometimes. And we want to get rid of atmospheres, so I'm going to put atmospheres on the bottom. So then all we need to know is, well, what's the relationship? Well, when Torricelli did his experiment, he did it at sea level, so that's like one atmosphere, and it was 760 millimeters at that sea level. So if Torricelli could build a, uh, a barometer that was capable of withstanding going like underneath the water, like highly pressurized submarines, you need to use oxygen tanks. How many millimeters of mercury would it require then? Anybody else get that? Okay, we got a problem. Sig digs. How many sig digs do we get based on these measurements? Currently are showing four. So here's how you should solve that problem. Write it like this. 3.2 times 10 to the 3 millimeters of mercury. So I kind of like found a sneaky way to get around sig digs. I don't have to write four digits anymore. Here there's one, two, three, four digits. But if I move the decimal place over three times, you make it 3.2. Now I'm only showing <coughs> two sig digs. All right, and then last one, then we'll call it a day. Actually, to be honest, maybe I'll just leave this for you guys. Based on the skills I've just shown you, my only goal today is to talk a bit about how gases work, which we did. And if there's anything for you to do, it's can you convert units from one type to another? So. Any questions? Okay, so quick recap then. Gases are very loosely compacted. I can walk through air. It does not stop me whatsoever. Because gas particles are so far apart from each other. Ooh, sorry, by the way, I want to make another point here. Let's say I drew a picture of a box, and these were gas particles. Or, for example, here's a box, and this is a solid because they're all tightly next to each other. What is in this space right here between particles? Anybody know? Nothing. Literally nothing. There is not air between air particles. There is literally absence of everything there. We have a name for that. Maybe you've heard this before. It's called a vacuum. You've never heard that before? I guess a vacuum of space. Okay. In between gas particles, here's a gas particle, there's a gas particle, here's a gas particle. In between those particles is literally nothing. There's not air between those particles because those particles are our air. So. Anyways, gases, you can compress gases. Gases can escape. Gases can move all over the place. I can hit gas particles at you by doing this. Are you going to feel it? Probably not. However, they are still particles. They are still doing something. They have pressure. Pressure being defined as how much force they give over a certain amount of area. More pressure usually happens at like sea level. The higher up in terms of altitude you go, the less pressure there happens to be. And if you go underwater, there's actually a lot of pressure. It's not actually due to gases, though. It's due to like the water compacting instead. Does that make sense?
My goal then, I need you to know the three main units of pressure. It sucks that you have to know all three, because it would be nice if it was just one. But the three units are atmospheres, millimeters of mercury, and kilopascals. So if you guys can handle this, then we're good for the day. Questions? Okay, you guys know about the student vote thing? Yeah. Okay, I've been told we're supposed to go down like now? Yeah. Is it 10.30 we're supposed to go? Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know what we'll do for the rest of the class, whether we'll have much time, but do whatever it is you guys need to finish them. So make sure I get assignments and labs though sometime before the end of the day. Okay. Thanks guys. Thank you.